they are also incomplete or unfinished for the same for the same reasons most probably. And most of the times they are of short time value. All these likes, or we uh, enter into Facebook, all these kinds of user generated content we produce most often doesn't have a lasting value. I would stay on this. I have written several papers on the ephemeral nature of the web. I would stay on this now. And I move, but just describe the characteristics of social data. What makes them distinctive and how social data converges into this big kind of developments we some often summarize or subsume under the label of big data. So our object of study, as already mentioned, uh, is a, a web-based medical research network <coughs> that, which is patients like me, the most important uh, in the world these days, which relies on patients self-reporting to collect and analyze data on the health status of patients suffering from any kind of condition, including severe condition. So the network, we believe, casts the pursuit of medical knowledge in an entirely new web-based context that is centered on capturing the patient experience in the form of in social data data input entered by patients themselves distributed all over the globe. So, getting into the outline of uh, our <coughs> what we're going to do uh, just shortly is first to define the object of our study and the questions we would like to raise which we think they cry, out, they cry out for an explanation by relating to what patients like me is doing to the traditional institutional context through which medical knowledge or in which medical knowledge has been produced. That's the first thing we're going to do. Then we will describe the architecture of data collection uh, in patients like me in that social platform with an emphasis on how symptom data collection is being made. And that would be done by and large for Nico, his, 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 his peers with a severe supervision of me. <laughs> How could there be anything else? Ah, uh, well, I know that's fine. And then we will end up uh, in the findings and conclusions. So I think we have three or four clusters of very interesting conclusions. One of them being the computed sociality that Nick mentioned earlier. So, Nico, please. So, um, starting with the empirics, then we take a, a step into uh, the uh, uh, evidence, the, the narrative that, uh, that we want to propose about this uh, mm -hmm. case. And uh, so patients like me, first of all, first of all what, what it is. Again, it's a social media platform that uh, aims to connect patients to other patients like them. That's the, that's, uh, the tagline. And, uh, and so that patients can uh, learn about their own condition or also maybe uh, about uh, um, life, um, life changes, lifestyle changes, treatments, treatment regimes that they may learn from or and then uh, try out in their own life. Uh, so it's all kinds of purposes. It can be just social support to eventually also finding uh, cures or just coping with the disease on a daily basis. Uh, and finding the best strategies. So um, then the next, so the platform does this for patients, and uh, and it does this for from for patients through patient self-report. So patients are able to, con as we will show, patients are able to connect with other patients uh, through reporting their health status, through stating what's the what's the situation, what the diagnosis is, how they are feeling, 
what's the condition they are suffering. And so the more they specify uh, what's their health uh, right now, uh, the more the platform is able to connect them with other patients and, and, and propose uh, uh, opportunities for socialization. So, um, but, uh, but at the same time, of course, this is a for-profit company that uh, tries to uh, then to keep developing and stay in the business, keep developing this uh, platform and, and continue to expand its, its, its features. So the patients of the reporting is, is geared with the scientific orientation, which means uh, it's, uh, the, 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 it's a structure that the patients are reporting is structured <coughs> along a number or a set of data fields and uh, the structured data and, and both unstructured uh, data, forums, conversations, as well as, uh, as forums. Um, because the organization tries to, to build medical knowledge with the, with the data that patients give for their socialization uh, goals. So they aggregate the data that they collect, they analyze it, and then they, they try to uh, uh, publish <coughs> research. Some of it is commercial research, and some of it is uh, scientific research. Uh, Oftentimes, it's both, both things at the same time, so they, they develop papers with the, with the clients. And so they have uh, published quite a number of uh, scientific outputs, uh, including uh, uh, numerous peer-reviewed articles. So as we, um, as we first approach the analysis of then this network, two things uh, stand out, of course. There's a process of scientific of science making. And uh, at one end of, the, of, this, of this process, it, it stands as a kind of raw material, a myriad of patient observations about their life experience. We will see in the specific case of symptoms, this will be used today, my headache is very simple, for example. Um, and at the, as the final product, a number of peer-reviewed articles, including even in top journals like Nature Biotechnology and other scientific uh, publications. So it comes very intuitive, natural, good thing to say, to ask, how does it happen? How really does this play out in the details? And so another way to phrase this is, uh, is uh, we, we see that there's a network that seems to be addressing traditional expert problems, like producing medical science, through massive involvement of non-professionals, like patients, via um, uh, structuring these uh, interactions uh, through backward-based solutions. So the issue is, we feel, to explain or to account for, to provide some sort of an account as to how our patient data contributions, contributions made by lay people, basically, how can be so organized so that can reliably provide the raw material for expert knowledge for medical research. And that boils down basically to what sort of data fields, architectures, processes and information mechanics guide this data collection. This I think is a very important thing we have to do and I think I'm glad also that critical social science has to do if it has to criticize what it aims to criticize. So and we want to take it a further step if we would yeah, it would be kind of speculative though, because this system, this kind of things develop adjacent to incumbent organizations and institutions. It's a hugely established system in healthcare by hospitals, organizations, <coughs> laboratories, governments, spaces. How does this fit into this overall system? We We'll say a few words about this. But what we uh, want to start into defining more clearly the, uh, uh, the problem we want to address is that this way of developing data uh, for medical research uh, is different, we claim several times, from traditional ways of developing research, but in the sense that it doesn't any longer involve the medical expert as the indispensable 
fascinating. So if you want me to use some acronym of the word, it's a metal like <laughs> <laughs> the obligatory passage for, uh, for data collection. So what happens, uh, what happens therefore now, say, and that's a distinctive attribute, is that the generation of data doesn't happen through the medical expert, who is the medical doctor, the nurse, or any other professional that previously recorded and created the data. Data not thus created was never looked upon as medical or expert data, or invalid. So what happens here now is you have the creation of data by a distributed population of lay actors. And I can hear some of you protesting, perhaps even more so uh, Professor Porter, that the, uh, there's a history, of course, of medical data management that goes back in the beginnings of the preceding century in which uh, uh, of non-medical, I would say, expert involvement in medicine. In, uh, you know, hospitals, as we know now, they were created basically, as we know now, I say, in the United States, not in Europe. In the beginning of the uh, last, the beginning of the 20th century, and they were consolidated as institutions, as we know them now, by creating an army of technicians and professions and occupations of data management, including librarians and data editors of all kinds who systematize and make data available for research and for, of course, treatments. But there's an important difference. These people systematize data that were always entered in books and passing records by experts has an important difference not to be bypassed. So, though there is a history of non kind of centrally medical expert involvement in hospitals, in medical care, of using, distributing, systematizing uh, data, what happens today is entirely different. So, so to add on this, we know that uh, really the traditional logic of, of uh, data collection has uh, traditionally been by and large uh, in specific institutions, um, organizations such as research hospitals, primary care facilities, or, or laboratories. So also the uh, very, very, very localities of data collection have been uh, traditionally confined among two specific places. And Needless almost to say, uh, the, resulting, the result really of the previous three conditions is that uh, traditionally, by and large, patients uh, have always been relegated to marginal dependent positions in the process of data collection. So, what is uh, why this uh, this uh, data collection process is alternative? We are going to explain a little bit more of the specifics. So then, again, this is the home page of the network. And uh, we see again that these, these tripartite sort of rationale for uh, participating in this network. You can learn from others through connecting with people like you by tracking your health. And that's essentially really it. Uh, you, need to, you need to do the tracking of your health in order to really to successfully connect with people like you and then eventually learn something from that. So there's uh, uh, the, the platform uh, gives its users a number of uh, features. Uh, some of them, they are traditional <coughs> social network features, uh, pretty standard, they include the messaging features, broadcasting, and self-representations like profile picture and bio, and things like this. Then there's a number of health tracking tools. They have the specific tools of this network, and they are uh, tools for tracking symptoms and the, uh, on specific dates and their severities, tools for tracking Treatments in, that include uh, drugs, treat, various treatment regimes, but also lifestyle modifications, equipment. Uh, so in case of drugs, it, it includes uh, related dosage frequency, and patients can evaluate the drugs that they perceive benefit. 
And then there's of course weight trackers, lots of labs and tests, like including cell counts and or air force flight of capacity. These depend of course on the uh, condition that the patients uh, suffer. And patient reported outcomes, which are um, <coughs> the quintessential uh, feature of uh, self-reported data because they are uh, questionnaires and surveys that are developed specifically <coughs> for specific conditions and then are attributed to the patient profiles specifically according to the specific conditions that a patient has in the profile. So this is an example of part of the uh, profile. <coughs> um, uh, this, is, uh, this is a patient that has opted to, to make her um, uh, profile public, so I didn't really need to anonymize, but just, uh, just because uh, I, I, um, as a past. Um, uh, so we, we have the picture, we have the about me, and we have some uh, some uh, basic uh, pieces of information, like uh, you, know, you can read, but it is diagnosis, the date of the diagnosis, the first symptom, what, when it, it, it happened, and what's the condition, what's the diagnosis. And here we've got uh, uh, instant me is a feature for describing the states that a patient feels generally, a general evaluation of how I feel today in these moments. The quality of life is a complex uh, questionnaire that uh, tries to map various aspects of the, of the life of the patient. Um, FRS is in this case a, a patient reported outcome that is specific to lateral sclerosis um, and measures uh, physical uh, disability. Um, and this is the second part of the, of the profile, it's still not all because we don't have weight, weight tracking and other, other uh, pieces, but uh, this is the essential part. The treatment, we've got uh, a list of drugs um, and indications about the frequency, the dosage, and according to various dates, and corresponding symptoms, various symptoms, anxious mood, depressed mood, fatigue, insomnia, pain, uh, emotional ability, <coughs> with severities according to dates. And the various dots indicate the points of the depression. So, um, the system automatically uh, aggregates and, and, and outputs the, the, the data that it collects for the patient, for the use of the patient. And that is essentially of two kinds. The, of course, uh, the individual patient data, like we just saw in the patient uh, profile, it gives a snapshot, a visualization, uh, a, a rendition of what's the situation about that specific individual, and then it, uh, it uh, outputs a number of uh, data visualizations and, and other pieces of information uh, representing medical entities at the population level, so aggregating patients that are suffering from uh, the same condition or uh, the same symptom. And they, and then slides and dots the database in various ways. So this is an example, for example, of a, of the most popular, perhaps, uh, symptom uh, for a patient experience. It's a pain system. And this is a record page for the patient with the pain symptom. It's got a pie chart with the distribution of severity, severe, uh, moderate, mild, and non, and uh, the, number, the number of patients suffering currently of these, uh, of these severities. And these uh, um, treatments that patients are taking for curing pain, so tramadol, 797 uh, uh, patients are stating that right now currently they are taking uh, tramadol for treating pain. Uh, then it uh, shows, uh, it, it gives links to patient profiles of uh, other patients experiencing pain, <coughs> but eventually a link to really gross all the 31,000 patients that are currently experiencing pain. <laughs> or through natural language, or through natural language processing, it uh, uh, selects conversations about pain that are happening in form and that a patient might be interested in. Or also, there's the option to go and browse uh, 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 by hands. So, if we if we take then a, a, a further plunge into one of these medical entities, we take then the symptoms also because they are ontologically a bit simpler to track and, uh, and to explain and to analyze. So the simple reporting uh, collects these uh, pieces of, essentially these pieces of, uh, of uh, information. The severity of the symptom on specific dates, the association of the symptom with the treatments, a, a, symptom, a symptom can be uh, a side effect of the treatment, 
or a treatment can be taken for it affecting a specific symptom. And uh, there's three, essentially, three ways to associate symptoms to, uh, to patient's profiles on a symptom, this attract symptoms list. There's three ways. One is that there are uh, general symptoms, and these are automatically added to the patient profile because they uh, assume that uh, they represent patient, they, they, they affect patient's life at least in one stage of the patient life uh, of all kinds of conditions, of patients of all kinds of conditions. So anxious mood, depressed mood, fatigue, and so on. Then there's condition specific symptoms upon creation of the condition in, in the system. The experts of the, of the, of the network uh, state what symptoms are recognized by the researcher to be characteristic of that specific condition. So that upon then uh, uh, addition of, this, of a condition to a patient profile by the patient herself, the, the, the system drives automatically this, this uh, bunch of symptoms. If, there are, if the system knows this bunch of symptoms, it does not uh, what happens for most of the conditions in the, in the network. Then it drives these symptoms automatically on the list. And then the third way is on patient request. Of course, the, the reality of, of, of uh, patient experience it, for all kinds of conditions is really then the, 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 the patient experience is extremely diverse and individual. And so if you really want to know, uh, capture what's going on with the specific patients, you need to let them tell you what's happening. And so, uh, patients can search for a symptom where they can find links to symptoms and through these then they can add symptoms to the profile. One example is, for example, on the symptom report, here there's this link that it says my profile are you experiencing pain and through linking and clicking to this link, uh, patients can easily then add the pain to the, of course the pain is, uh, is already added for most of them, uh, for all the new ones. But uh, that's the way to add, one of the ways to add the symptom. So if the symptom is not present in the database, then a, 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 a number of further actions need to be triggered though, because it's much easier if, of, of course, the headache is already present and it's sick the patient. You can search headache and then they can add it with a few clicks. But what if the patient is saying, I've got this and that and it's not already present? Then, then the patient can initiate the creation of the new symptom record. They can submit a request for the creation of a specific symptom. I think it's important to say that this is pivotal to what we say here because it's that process with which the patient takes the initiative of creating or initiating the process through which a symptom is registered. That, so that is pivotal. And this is, uh, this is really what allows uh, the, the, the uh, network, the organization, to cultivate really its, its discovery potential. It is that they can, they can cover uh, and capture phenomena that are not necessarily categorized in medicine. <coughs> sometimes these phenomena might not be relevant for medicine. Or sometimes they are phenomena that are known in medicine, uh, they are categorized in medicine, but at a uh, uh, more coarse level of granularity. I mean, this allows patients to go much specific and much deeper about what they feel. So, this is the idea that, uh, that, the, that the patient voice is recorded in the form of data entries, and uh, and uh, and really the, what these uh, what uh, what this uh, process uh, affords is really also to capture data that is uh, a little bit leading out with this very constrained um, context of uh, symptom reporting, and sometimes it's more about uh, concerns or uh, interpretations or ideas. Um, so it really pushes a little bit the boundaries also of what, uh, what the definition of a symptom is. So again, this is the diagram that summarizes how the conditions, how the symptoms get into the patient profile. Some of them, they are generic and they go to small patients on their symptoms list. And some of them, they are assigned by staff upon creation of the conditions, so they are condition specific when the patient adds the condition that is on the symptoms list. And these are the two ways that the system pushes symptoms to uh, the, the symptoms list. You can also say that this is standard knowledge. Yes, basically. it is what is, yeah. what is uh, recognized. Yeah. Uh, and then there's a, 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 a spool way by custom symptom search. So if it is recorded, then uh, it goes on the symptoms list. If it is not already recorded, then uh, the, uh, 
the, the new symptom needs to be requested and it will go to for the, the pool, so it will go to add to the pool of the, the system symptoms. So in this way, then the patient can initiate new symptom recreation, and actually that's really the only way that patients have that all the symptoms got on the on the on the platform, but for the first initial 40 symptoms when this when the network was already covering amyotrophic platelet sclerosis. Since then, all of them they have been added by patients. And uh, uh, the idea is again that this uh, this potentially can be can make a difference for this platform compared to other forms of traditional forms of uh, data collection where there's a clinician that is, has got a very specific interest that is tied to the very specific data collection exercise that they are working in. Um, and instead in a network that, uh, that uh, preemptively and uh, openly uh, uh, collects uh, uh, all sorts of patient definitions, patient symptom definitions, then this could be then, uh, useful for in further patients. And in this way, then, the, 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 the network got to, got to record and uh, create about 7,000 symptoms, which is much more than what usually symptom um, systems uh, uh, contain. Um, and uh, with very, very specific uh, uh, symptom definitions. So, but of course, we want to ask now, these 7,000 symptoms is, uh, of course, a very, very uh, huge amount, uh, degree of fragmentation. There's a lot of fragmentation. What about standards of scientific evidence? How can we use all these patient definitions for, for then scientific research? Um, how do we uh, make sure that, uh, that there are not uh, two uh, uh, patient definitions of a symptom that are actually look like they are different, but actually for medical relevance, uh, they are quite the same, and we would like to gain that. Then this is how the expert comes into the picture. So the symptom, uh, the symptom request is uh, reviewed by the clinical expert, and the, and the, and the, and the process is then, since here, then on, is, is uh, controlled and guided by the experts. And it's got a number of actions that they can take. Well, first of all, they usually investigate and the case and clarify. They can go on the internet to look for uh, uh, more or less authoritative sources of, of information, PubMed and various medical encyclopedias, or when really phenomena are a little bit at the edges, then even the Wikipedia sometimes is, it could, be, could be a source of information. And then, of course, they can message the patient to ask for clarifications, more explanation, more details about what did you really mean when you were saying that. Or they can, uh, there's, uh, there's uh, a lot that can be guessed just by looking at the profile. If, if, if a patient has got a BTM profile or uh, is stating that uh, her weight is uh, a, a thousand kilograms, then uh, that, puts, uh, that, that uh, indicates the expert that maybe you need to check really for the reliability of this patient's measurements. So how, how, how is she really understanding what the, what the collection exercise is about? Instead, if you find a very meticulous uh, uh, kind of profile, then you, you know so lots of the patients are also doctors themselves, and so you, you change the, the sort of the registers of the communication. Then, when when really no solution is if can be found, sometimes the expert decides really to seek it to archive this for later. Maybe these uh, these instances will come up again later on, and so it can be archived because it's not it's not clear what to do about this. Otherwise, sometimes. Uh, uh, it could be enough uh, a major misspelling error, or uh, really the, the patient definition is not saying anything. That is that that, that another uh, symptom definition that is already present in that base would say. And so then the decision is to merge the patient data to uh, already present criteria. And this happens in conversation with the patient, in, in exchanges and in conversation with the patients. Sometimes with the with the outrage of the patients, and sometimes not. Um, and then, of course, they can split the, 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 the symptom definition, because sometimes it really is just uh, patients are very simply putting in more than one uh, symptom in the same string, so they, they put two take cognitive impairment, which are clear, clearly one is two take and the other one is cognitive impairment. So the, the expert can take these two, split them, and manage them to the already present categories. And then, of course, then finally, it can create, and that's how 
most of the, of the systems have been created um, and the system can be created uh, and the uh, description is added by the, by the expert and the symptom uh, typically is coded on the background on expert classification systems and this is a crucial operation this is the crucial operations for transforming all these patient experience uh, um, witnessing uh, into medical evidence because uh, it allows them to aggregate the very granular and diversified uh, descriptions of essentially for medical standards the same phenomena. Um, sometimes you might be uh, willing to really explore all the varied ways of, uh, uh, of uh, by which to take could manifest. Uh, in patient life, and sometimes really for the kind of uh, uh, research exercise that you are running, it's not necessary. And so, for example, uh, under the ICD-10 code for demoralization and apathy, the, the network uh, hosts a, a big number of uh, different uh, definitions, and some of them are like this, and loss of ambition, loss of interest, not caring further, if I die, apathy, no motivation, inability to initiate tests, these are not. And for patients, it might be meaningful to really distinguish between these. Of course, there's, there's uh, not caring between that not caring further if I die or apathy. There's a big difference, and uh, and so sometimes for research, you might want to distinguish between these two instances. Sometimes not. Okay, it's important also to notice, uh, to Nicole, that none of these experts are medical doctors. They are nurses and biologists. And related profession, but not medical doctors. It's important to know that. So we think, I mean, this is a very brief <coughs> description of a very complex case. There's no doubt about that. Uh, um, but I still want to hope that you got the flavor of, the, of, of what's going on here, even very shortly and briefly. And I think out of these empirical description, we would like to use a number of conclusions or provisional conclusions. One of them being a further elaboration of the idea of being uh, developed in the introduction of this talk, which is the contrast of these forms of data with traditional data collection. The second would be, I believe, is a very important conclusion or finding or provisional conclusion, whatever you may call, which is the idea about how the counting of things that person have provided the argument of connecting patients with other patients, what's what we call computed sociality or interaction and communication between past patients being made possible through calculations that would have otherwise been impossible to make. And the third kind of argument we want to spend a little bit of time is how expert work becomes data work. Uh, it's an idea that has been with us at least since Susanna Zubov wrote a fantastic book in the age of the smart machine. Uh, which we further develop here with the help of Subo herself that have read this and commented uh, uh, on a number of things about it. So I think if, we, if I start with the first, you do the second Nico, and then I jump onto the other, uh, I think that what we, the anatomy of that system or the physiology of that system uh, contrasts the canonical models of data collection in incumbent institutions. The institutions, the hospitals, the medical care institutions, and institutions doing research on medicine. And I think this anatomy and physiology of the system breaks away a from first the standard methods. Standard methods here are presumably many, but two standard as the most important. One is the clinical interview, with which data 
are registered and the, other, and the other is a very complex statistical methodology that is called randomized control trials. This is named. It breaks away from these standard methods and in so doing, and we show how it breaks away. Here the fundamental thing is data entry and aggregation. But in so doing, it also breaks away from the environment of clinical research, which is laboratories, hospitals, and other settings of medical clinical research. That's one thing which is different. Now we make the contrast more tidy as it may be, but it, you know, we always do that for communication and rhetorical reasons when we are also doing this. The second thing, it's the second kind of provisional conclusion, is that patients are at the center, not the expert, of data generation. Data entry is largely unsupervised. If there is a supervision here, is through the architecture of the system. Data field and data subfields and structures ultimately resting on a database. And a relative, <coughs> there is some expert contribution, but I would describe that as a relatively modest expert contribution. The third provisional conclusion has to do a little bit with the way we describe social data in the beginning as unfinished and used agnostic. Here, I think the patients like me wants to provide a, what they themselves say, a holistic approach to health and a consequent holistic data collection that must be so instrumental as to harvest data which at the moment we may not know what to do exactly about, but we still do so, and remain also truthful to the fact that these data are never erased. Anything that the patient enters, he never erased, never changed. You can produce other data on the basis of this, but the initial data remain what they are. It's an ethical principle of never raising uh, medical uh, data entered by patients. So in general, we will we'll describe therefore this as an open way of harvesting data in the hope that you can aggregate, manipulate, work, distinguish <coughs> with any ways that you don't know at the moment that they may be useful. And finally, and I think that's also very important, this is a longitudinal data collection taking place uh, 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 through all stages of patient life, and it's also continuing. And that's what standard medical research cannot do by definition. It can do other things that patients like me cannot do, of course, but it can do the longitudinal <coughs> and the continuous because it doesn't have access to patients every day. And patients that are distributed all over the world. Institutions have not been concerned with every danger. They dealt with more recurrent things which they hope to say and offer to us in other ways than the ways we describe here. Thereby, we embark yeah. on computed sociality. Yes, yeah, so a way to get to this is also a, a, further, a way to further specify um, how patients are at the center of data generation. Another way to look at it is that uh, in this network, patient, if the patient is definitely becoming an, a, a stable collaborator upon which expert organizing depends. In the sense that, of course, we understand that patients like me, as a business, as an organization, depends on, on the stable collaboration by its master users. Of course, none of them is, is critical on their own, but if they were all to disappear all of a sudden, then the, the business could not go on. 
And so in this sense, if you take the organization that's left to better organize and the patient is a, is a critical component. Uh, but of course, the patients are, are in the organization for various motivations. And first of all, the main is to socialize, to learn from others, to connect. And they do that through traction. So uh, while patients like me need to um, cultivate a steady data inflow, of course, then uh, uh, social interaction features are, are constructed and they are developed in order to induce and support this data inflow. And so, um, as we saw through the, the, all these links and, and opportunities to find other patients, then uh, the idea is that socialization opportunities are here constructed through data sharing. The patients share their data first, share their health status in order then for the system to be able to help them to find patients like that. If you don't tell me what diagnosis you've got, I can let you meet other, other patients that have got the same diagnosis. It's not simple. So uh, the system links patients with other patients with in various, mod in various modalities, um, among which uh, are forum rooms, of course. Patients are assigned to forum rooms according to the uh, conditions they, they have. Uh, through patient search, where the number of filters are given to the patient, and, uh, and the filters are, of course, matched to the various data points that the patient has shared, shared with the network and to links to other patients that are dynamic, dynamically constructed in various different pages. We saw, so here, in, if we take again the pain, pain report page, there's a, there's a number, a host of opportunities for patients to, 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 uh, to connect and socialize with others. So they are here, for example, in the, the, through these numbers, you can connect with other patients that are uh, experiencing same severity. Or, uh, here, there's uh, other patients that are taking the same treatment for uh, affecting uh, pain. And uh, here, there's links for uh, profiles of other patients that are suffering uh, from the same, um, from the same uh, symptom. And, of course, also the forum conversations where you can go and find the patients that are talking about pain. So, then it's, it's, it's in, this, in this perspective that we coined this, uh, this definition of computer sociality where really the opportunities for connection, the opportunities for socialization are opened upon data sharing, after the data sharing instance and, and, and according to the various uh, pieces of data that the, that the patient is, uh, is sharing. And uh, the intermediating uh, data aggregation and, and, uh, and data representation techniques, of course. First, they share the data, and then the data is sliced, revised, and, and the links are constructed. Very good. All this, uh, we'll have to run it quickly, Nicole, because we run out of time uh, uh, very quickly then. Uh, all this makes evident that a significant amount of expert work is made on the basis of confronting those sign and symbol systems we call data. And no humans here, but distant, are spread all over the world, distributed, entering their world and their experiences in the form of texts and other kind of conditions which they are uh, maybe quantitative sometimes. Data and all inferences, aggregations and conclusions are being based on the on data. Is a line of argument that is not new and has been analyzed, as I said before, uh, excellently 26 years ago uh, by Susanna Zubov in the age of Mark Massey when he spoke about these processes and what he called, she called then, the creation of the electronic text. At that time, but good works last, and her work still lasts, and has value, and we could make a number of things here, but we will stop here and just say that, again, and repeat, that a significant amount of expert work is being made in they are in the form of confronting data and descriptions of reality based on data. And that concludes the three kinds of arguments and to the
concluding remarks, Nico? Well, so um, as concluding remarks, then uh, if, we, if we want really to abstract the <coughs> key takeaway points of, uh, of, uh, of this uh, research is that uh, it is this alternative path to expert knowledge creation that it fundamentally uh, sidesteps the conditions uh, in which the research is traditionally been embedded. Then we have shown, we think we have shown how then uh, this alternative architecture of data collection work transforms the shape and nature of these data collection work. The social patient data are the raw material upon which the medical research is conducted, and it, uh, it, uh, and the, the, the very form by which patients self-reporting data uh, collection happens really then brings to focus aspects is, it, as I was saying, it bleeds over to the boundaries uh, really of medical relevance. Um, and and then uh, if we want to talk about uh, more generally about social media, is that uh, it's perhaps that uh, what social media could be fostering is that uh, is uh, is quite uh, important institutional changes. that are driven by uh, the involvement of uh, both agencies. Two final comments. One is that we didn't say anything about methodology, but we would be happy to answer any questions you want to make on this. We chose not to do that. And the second is that we would not be openly critical because our model of being critical is first passing through meticulous work on detail. And then you are allowed to be critical. Being critical <laughs> without detail is not my model and not because of Thank you very much. Uh, opportunities for uh, 
sort of uh, empowerment and uh, and uh, opportunities, eventual, eventual opportunities for the legitimization in some in some way. Yeah. Yes. I, I've got a question on the veracity of the data. Um, I have two specific points. Um, how do you deal with the symptom of death? Because uh, <laughs> is it going to have a negative effect on everyone with a similar disease? And also, there's the issue of a sort of mild form of Munchausen syndrome, where everybody copies the syndromes. Because I'm reminded of the definition of a minor uh, operation. A minor operation is one the other guy has. <laughs> and so there's the, the sort of accelerated yes. form of, oh, I've got that as well. So, so how are these dealt with? <coughs> okay, so first of all, the death is death not is, can I so it is dealt with in the other life when you pass the Akeran <laughs> River. <laughs> that is not really a problem because. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> you may so must be one of these days. Solomon is a When Yanis does that. It's death knocking on the door. <laughs> so what I meant to say is uh, <laughs> that uh, the network, the, the researchers of the network can, um, um, first of all, they can still use the patient data. When a patient dies and simply not doesn't submit any more data, you can still have a, a, a record of what was happening <coughs> at the end. Then you don't know. But maybe you can make a use of the previous Data that's one way and then there's a feature that is used by lots of, of relatives that is to declare the patient as diseased and so the, the patient profile has a sort of a black stripe and it says it's diseased and it, with a date on but of course it, they need to have a relative and we'll check that for you um, and th there was a second question yes the Munchausen right. syndrome um, well, that, then, of course, the, the problem with, uh, with this network, and that, that's why, as we were saying, um, it can't really do the same kind of uh, research uh, exercises that uh, clinical hospitals would do in many, uh, in many uh, instances, is that uh, this data set is, uh, is uh, endemically often, there's a self-reporting bias, a selection bias, um, that uh, they can't, they can't um, um, address at, uh, at the structural level. So, in that sense, but but at the same time, usually these syndromes are, uh, they are so rare, and then they they are uh, likely incidents of uh, of the specific research exercise is even rarer. <coughs> That's probably on statistic on statistical uh, uh, for statistical relevance, they wouldn't really affect the results. Well, um, but isn't it my wife? Yeah, sorry, that's not uh, main cold. There's always worse than a female cold. Right. I, I have a question. I think this is very, very interesting. Uh, what about the retention of the actual patient members here? Have you guys looked at uh, uh, how that works throughout the years? Because they have been operating for a couple of years, except of course for the, for those who are uh, have passed away. But but the retention is very, very important for the for yes. the data for the quality of data. Absolutely. So what can you say about? Do you have anything to say about the? Yes. Uh, the continuity, the sustainability. Absolutely, yes. that, that's really uh, the uh, the main the main other part of my research is uh, is to document the efforts of this uh, of this uh, network as they develop a system that they need to uh, where they need to cultivate for the quality of information, but for information, and information is really a factor of the quality of the data, the specificity of the data, and the quantity of the data that it gets. But this is often a uh, the quality is often at odds uh, with patient engagement because the more you ask, the more you turn away patients. So there's a there's a trade-off here that the patient that this network needs to find and it's very important. So that's an excellent question. This is the, really the, the 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 risk the you know the lethal risk for this network is that you you don't sustain. Uh, 
longevity or what is social media in some cases is called uh, stickiness. The user stickiness. But it's not only for this, for every social media. Alexi. Uh, what happens if the uh, patient stops producing good quality data because the company leaves out of data? So in that sense, these patients are working for the company by producing the data. And I ask this because I've seen it in some other cases that when you have individual level data, you can actually sanction the access to service that you really produce something for it. So do they chuck out people who produce bad quality data or don't produce data? No. Okay. They don't because uh, because the promise for the patients is that you, you are there, it's free for you, and you can connect with other people. So, and then you can use it in order to connect with other people. Okay. Maha and then Erika. But oh, there's a lot of people here. And Maha, go. Yeah, we will. My question is really simple uh, because yeah. I was looking at your heading over and over again. It kept saying alternative data collection methods. And I was thinking, my father was a doctor, and looking at some of the forms of collecting material and what kind of questions were asked, very basic diagnosis questions, I was wondering, we don't see the resemblance, because I mean, the interface looks different, of course, it looks more engaging, perhaps, even. But I wonder, when you say the architecture is in such a way that you can collect data differently, how different really is it from the questions that are actually asked by medics or of any kind? Are they really asking different questions? So is the data collection different? What's different? What elements? And how does that then out? So the unstructured forms. But I remember my father listening to patients and then saying, you know, just writing a few notes down. And that kind of meant that he was filtering the diagnosis symptoms in, with his expert head or whatever on. But, but uh, it's data collection work architecture. So in that sense, we, it depends also not only on the questions you ask, but who is people applies to them. Who is really writing down the data? That's, that's the fundamental thing. You will never be able to register down the data yourself. You have to reply. You have a standard questionnaire on which you reply, but you don't enter that. But, but you can say more, and the doctors tend to write what they feel read. Yeah. I agree. Right. That's, yeah. the, that's the main point. But don't you do the same thing here? You filter at the end of the day. Your algorithm no. would filter no. the symptoms. No, because. 7, because no, because we are saying, so the, the, the data entry is largely unsupervised, and by this we mean that uh, uh -huh. as long as you keep uh, inputting data about symptoms that are already present in the database, mm -hmm. nobody is really there to discuss if you really have to take them. Mm -hmm. So you just add it, and you just add data. So it's still That's easy. essentially, so the expert review is upon symptom creation, which happens for one patient only of the thousands of patients that men have to take the first one. So that's the expert will review what to take is really. And the, the, the symptom is created, is, it becomes part of the database, and then all the others can follow. Right? So in that sense, of course, there's an expert that will take essential decisions, should this symptom be in the database or not. But after that, there's, a, there's a, 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 an infinitely bigger amount of interactions that are unsupervised. And it's also important not to say this as black and white. We said, for rhetorical reasons, we would make the contrast to communicate our argument. Of course, there are areas of commonality, but also important differences that will not be good to overlook or to subsume under, you know, a presumption kind of similarity. Okay. Yeah, so, so two quick comments. The first one is this idea of patient-centered initiatives where the research participant is a partner rather than as a patient is something that isn't just kept to companies like patients like me. Lots of medics are doing it. So I think your <coughs> unsubtle distinction between the medical research cannot do anything like that is just wrong. And it gives, it has a rhetoric, but it gives a very, very misleading picture. I know of uh, m a number of studies that are doing self-reported data for very specific medical conditions where the patients, the social media, all of that is happening, but it's being driven by existing medical experts. So it's, you need to be careful as to whether it's the self-reported data or the data analysis that you're doing. The second one that's quite interesting about this is, of course, that one of the features of this process is it doesn't have one of the, the you used to talk about sidestepping traditional data collection procedures and this comes back to Louise's earlier comment one of the important features of traditional 
medical research is ethical review of any empirical studies, any data collection, any data handling, what you can do with the data after the person is deceased, etc., etc. And Patients Like Me is one of those organizations that basically sidesteps that whole traditional IRB process. Now, if you want to have an argument that IRB is... They're not doing clinical trials. But they're still doing, they're still doing medical data. They're still doing data on living human beings. And that, in most medical contexts, requires IRB approval. And it would certainly require it before the publications can be published in prestigious journals. So there isn't... You have to be careful about the sidestepping all of the evilness of traditional medicine. It's there for good reasons. But there was no judgment words. We can say we, on the, and there's another thing you can say about what the data that's done uh, are in terms of quality, but also in terms of uh, ethical issues. We didn't elaborate on that, but we didn't say that the old system is bad and this is good. And if that has come down that way, then it's completely wrong. We describe in some detail and I believe, uh, and I think I'm right to say so, that this is the first real work being done worldwide in such a detail on these social media platforms in medicine. I think you're incorrect in that assertion. Uh, uh, yeah, that's what I think. If you, and that's the point we try to make, to some degree of detail document the anatomy and the physiology of that system before we embark on, on a broader analysis of what is expert, what is medical work, what does work, what ethical issues are bypassed. Also, uh, this is not really part of the, the major drive of patient-centered healthcare, main, mainly because it's not healthcare. Patients like me is not, is, it's something that patients do on their own, they're not asked to, it's not part of programs. So it's, it, they have no incentive except for their own uh, motivations, what they find in the network, to participate in this network. And so it which is to, from, which is to from improve these, uh, their, projects of they are trying to improve their personal health by finding out what patients like them are doing and suffering from and responding yes, to, etc. That's healthcare. healthcare in a loose sense. It's not. Well, it, that's essentially different than, than saying that uh, this is uh, similar to, uh, to uh, national uh, initiatives uh, or uh, policies that are encouraging hospitals to run patient centered healthcare. And in that sense, also, then uh, to the other question, self reported uh, medical research, self reported data uh, medical research has been existing for decades. But it was, we can talk about this more, but it was essentially different because there were uh, specific projects very, in very specific contexts, questionnaires with uh, often fixed lists of items that you can add to, uh, fixed definitions that you can subscribe to. So, in that sense also, it's not only that there are other studies going on right now, there's, there's been many for decades, but they were different. I'm afraid we have to finish it. We've already surpassed by 10 minutes. But I think it's very, it's very important that these patients like me are not um, including proper ethical scrutiny at the set up of your trial. That is a very, very serious issue. Um, it is, you know, certainly in this country, you have to, as Edgar said, you have to um, have proper ethical uh, scrutiny. And there's certainly no reputable journal should be publishing things if you have to have proper ethical scrutiny. Thank you. Uh, Abby? Thank you very much.